So the first three and a half months of 2019 are already behind us. It's kind of been a blur for a lot of us. Um, for some of you, it has been a glorious three and a half months. You got that promotion at work that you've been hoping for, and uh, you've been checking things off your to-do list like a boss for three and a half months. You've kept all of your New Year's resolutions. That's really wonderful for you. Um, your family miraculously skipped the entire flu season this year. Your tax return was bigger than you ever hoped it would be, and you have had no allergy issues whatsoever. It's, it's been a wonderful three and a half months for you. It's like God's giving with both hands. And then there's the rest of us. And um, if you're in that first group, please don't take this the wrong way, but we don't like you right now. Um, ours has not been that same type of three and a half months. And it's not all been bad. Let me be very clear on that. It's not all been bad. Um, we have our own coffee mug at the doctor's office now. That, that's what they give you when every member of your family has the flu twice. It's a part of their gold package. Um, we stopped counting the number of times appliances broke at our house. And can I just tell you, there is nothing more unsatisfying than to pay to fix an appliance. Because you don't get a new one. It's not like there's new features on it. You're just paying your old one to do what you paid for the first time. It's like there's no benefit on that side for you. Also, um, that no sugar in 2019 resolution, that lasted 23 minutes into the brand new year. Somebody brought cheesecake to the New Year's Eve party. And what are you supposed to do at that point? It's either a resolution or my happiness at that moment. And allergies have been raging since October, and it seems like the to-do list has had babies, and we owed money on taxes, but, you know, all of those things, you know, off to the side, I hope you've enjoyed your first three and a half months of 2019. Now, as God is my witness, I had just finished writing the introduction for this message in my office at home, when my dog walks in, smile on her face, throws up all over my office floor. I don't speak dog, but I'm pretty sure she said, you left one off your list. Brah! <laughs> Exclamation points. I'm thinking to myself, really, God? Really? Like, I had plenty of material to get that point across right there. Have you ever started your prayer time with God? Have I done something to offend you? <laughs> and, and all I can say is, when you're standing in your office with fresh dog vomit on the ground, you've got questions that just come through your mind. So... We know life has challenges. There's ups and downs. There's things that go exactly as we hoped they would. And there's things that do not go well at all. And there's those times when it seems like hit after hit just keeps on coming. And at one point when somebody says, it's just a season that you're going through, you, you take a little bit of heart in that. But when that season turns into month after month and maybe even a couple of years, you begin to wonder, is this a season or is this my life? right now. We understand difficult things happen. But here's what I can tell you for every person who's had another challenge after another challenge after another challenge come into your life. Here's what I'll tell you is taking place in your mind. You will process every new challenge through the lens of self. How will this affect me? How will it affect my future, my family, my finances, my health. How will it affect my plans? And we process through the lens of self. And let me just say, that's normal. That's a part of being human. But even though it's a normal part of being a human, along the way, we begin to find ourselves where we're so focused on the next problem and the issues that we're seeing that literally the walls of our world begin to close in. Where at one point you might look out into your future and you see opportunities everywhere. When you go through problem after problem after problem, you begin to look out into your future with a little bit more of a pessimistic outlook. You look out into your future and you're thinking to yourself, I'm not sure what tomorrow is going to be because the last two months have been difficult. That's a normal part of being a human. But listen to this. Even though it's normal, here's what I want to say. When our focus turns inward on self, the walls of our world continue to close in. So what do you do in those moments? How do you come out of that funk that you're in and begin to see something at a little bit higher level? 
We understand difficult things are going to happen. You cannot escape problems in life. There's going to be problems that come with health and problems with job loss and problems with finances. Literally, in the first two messages after it's over, I've had people come to me and say, I lost my job this last week. Another person comes and said, I've been diagnosed with cancer this last week. That's, that's life. That's where we live. So if you can't escape those types of things, is there a way to reframe that moment? Chances are, even after this message, we will still process the initial challenge through the lens of self. But the question now becomes, how can we move past self with why me? Why now? When will God step in and deliver me? And how can we move and quickly focus on something that is bigger and far more beneficial? Here's your key truth for this morning. It's in your notes. Our focus and affections will always rest upon self until they are awakened and consumed by something bigger. This morning, I want to walk you through a moment in King David's life where he transitions from self-focus to being overwhelmingly delighting in the glory of God. And you, you see a complete change. I mean, he is literally consumed by something that is bigger than him. And as we go through this story, ask yourself the question, is it at least possible that God has divinely and perfectly instituted the first three and a half months of your life in this year so that you can have the joy of this exact same discovery? I invite you to join me over in the book of Psalm chapter 57. We're going to read an entire chapter this morning. I am going to read a verse and share some commentary, read a verse, share some commentary, and then we're going to come back to two of those verses at the very end, verse number five and verse number 11. They are identical in what they say, but it's in these two verses that we find not only what are we supposed to focus on in difficult times, but we also recognize what we're to focus on at all times. It's not just in the hard times, it's at all times. So this morning I'm speaking on the subject, my pain his glory. I invite you, if you would, look with me in the text. We'll have a word of prayer and get started in this. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask you today that our minds would be focused, that we would be able to see exactly how you are working the events of our life in a way in which it draws our attention to you and to your glory. God, may it seem as though this morning you are literally reading the mail of the people that are in the room. Lord, we look forward to what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, before we read the very first verse, I want to set up where we're at in the book of Psalms. Beginning in Psalm 52, David starts to reflect upon and describe a desperate period in his life. It's a time in which he was on the run in the wilderness for his life because King Saul was trying to kill him. And in Psalm 52, he refers to a guy by the name of Doeg the Edomite. And Doeg told Saul that David was hiding out in the small city of Nob, and he also shared that Ahimelech, the priest, was helping him. As a result of those words, Ahimelech and 84, the priestly families, were put to death. Then you go over into Psalm 54, and David refers to betrayal by the Zephites. The Zephites were his own countrymen. They should have protected him, and yet they went to Saul and said, he's hiding out among us. He's betrayed again. And then we go into Psalm 56, and it talks about David being seized by the Philistines in the city of Gath. He is alone. He's desperate. He's afraid. So he's coming off of hit after hit after hit. And then he goes to this cave known as Adullam. That is where we pick up in Psalm 57. He's in a cave. Now, I don't know if you all have ever had an opportunity to go and explore some caves. I've done it several times over the course of my life. But here's what I can tell you about even the big caves. They're still dark. I can tell you when you walk through the caves and you breathe in, it's this weird, stale, moist, aged air that you're breathing it's almost like you're breathing history as you walk through the place. It's in caves that your mind begins to play tricks on you. Words echo. Things flutter in the dark. Even if you're not claustrophobic, when you go far enough in a cave, it's like the walls keep closing in further and further. And it's in this cave, this dark place, 
that we find that David goes through and his, literally his focus and his fortunes change in this cave. According to 1 Samuel 22, it's in the cave of Adullam that his brothers and his father's household come and gather around him. It's in the cave of Adullam that he finds that those who are in distress, those who are in debt, those who are discontented rally around him. So in this cave, it says that there were over 400 men that gathered around him and he became their leader. But listen to this. We know all of those things happened in Adullam. What we do not know is if he wrote this psalm before or after those events. Based on how he began the writing, it seems as though this is happening beforehand. Because when he starts the, the chapter, he's talking with words of desperation. He's seeking God's protection and God's refuge. But it's in this psalm itself that you begin to see a change in the tone of his writing. All of those psalms that I just mentioned a few moments ago, his words could be characterized as uncertain and fearful and desperate. And yet in Psalm 57, there is this settled tone of victory. There is this praise that begins to come out. In fact, this psalm is so connected with praise and victory that over the last 2,000 years of Christendom, this psalm was written into the liturgy of many denominations as one to be read by the congregation on Easter Sunday. And the reason is because it's in this particular psalm that the cave that could represent his fate now becomes a symbol of the victory that he has in his relationship with God. So my question is, what happened in the cave? How did the focus change? How did he come from being fearful and distressed and overwhelmed to being in a place where he's praising God and he's excited and he's focused on the glory of God. This is not in your notes, but I want you to hear how the transition happens. In the earlier Psalms, David was hiding from his enemies. In this Psalm, David is hiding in his God. That's the transition mark. So I invite you to look with me now, verse number one. Let's read it together and just see what God has. It says, be gracious to me, O God. Be gracious to me, for my soul takes refuge in you. And in the shadow of your wings, I will take refuge until destruction passes by. This phrase, be gracious to me or have mercy on me, is very common in David's Psalms of Lament. Because of his great need, he is seeking asylum with God. He is seeking refuge and protection with God until, he says, until destruction passes by. It's almost as though mentally he knows this is going to pass. This is not going to happen forever. But while destruction is still outside the door, he's saying, God, would you give me refuge? Would you help me to endure? There are two things that are hiding in this one particular verse. That is, David was hiding physically in the dark shadows of a cave. And David is also hiding spiritually in the shadows of the wings of God in this one text. He is, God is so prominent in this text that he is either mentioned by name, by pronoun, or by phrase of description 21 different times in chapter 57. Here's what it says in verse 2. I will cry to God most high, to God who accomplishes all things for me. David calls God, God most high, Elohim Elyon. The name most high, it signifies that God is above all created things. He's above the heavens. He's above the earth. And David recognizes that it is God himself who accomplishes all things for me. His hope is not in himself. His hope is not that he can pull himself up. His hope is not, I got to get out of these circumstances. His hope is completely in God. Bring that back to you and I for just a moment. Our hope is not in the next raise. Our hope is not in the next report. Our hope is not in the next review. Our hope must remain in God. God alone knows what is best and will do what is best in the lives of his kids. Look at what it says in verse number three. He will send from heaven and save me. He reproaches him who tramples upon me. Selah. God will send forth his loving kindness and his truth. The word loving kindness is also translated as mercy in most translations of the Bible. 
In fact, David believes that God is going to deliver him through his mercy and his truth. Uh, Those words, mercy and truth, they characterize God. All the way back over in the book of Exodus, chapter 34, when God shared his name with Moses, he said, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Psalm 25, 10, it says, all the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth. Those two are critical words for every person. And then the word selah pops up. This is one of those words that even to this day, there's still questions about what does it actually mean? There's discrepancies that are between different Bible translators and Bible scholars. It's a word that shows up 71 times in the book of Psalms, three times in the book of Habakkuk. As best we can tell, scholars focus primarily on two meanings of what selah means. It is pause and think calmly about. Or it is number two, to praise and lift up. Either way we go, I like where it's going. Because he's saying, when I think about how God is going to save me, let me pause and think calmly about that. Or when he looks and says, when I think about how God is going to save me, let me lift him up and praise him. Either way we want to go, I'm absolutely okay with that. Look at what it says in verse number four. My soul is among lions. I must lie among those who breathe forth fire, even the sons of men, whose teeth and spears and arrows and their tongues a sharp sword. David is reflecting upon the lion-like qualities of those who were chasing after him. Just like lions, they're greedy to devour. Like men of war, he talks about them having spears and arrows and swords. When he refers to their tongue, and he also refers to their implements of warfare, he's basically saying by their words and by their actions, they are vicious. They are attacking me. They are coming after me. He might be among individuals who are his enemies. But he is hiding in the protection and the love of God. Look at what it says in verse 5. Be exalted above the heavens, O God. Let your glory be above all the earth. This phrase is also translated, exalt yourself, O God, above the heavens. The word exalt, it comes from two different words. There's ex, meaning out, and alt, meaning up. To exalt is to pull out from amongst others and to lift up for all to see. So whenever you read the word exalt in the Psalms, it says exalt the Lord together. Exalt him with a a triumphant heart. What it's basically saying is let's pull God out from among any pretender, from among anybody else, from among any who think that they're going to compete for who he is. Pull him out and lift him up so that everyone can see him. That's what the word exalt here means. He says, exalt yourself, God, above the heavens. And then he also says, let your glory be above all the earth. We got to talk about glory for just a moment. It's also one of those words that is hard to translate. In fact, to say what is the glory of God is almost like asking someone to define beauty. There's certain words in our vocabulary that are often better communicated by what we see than by what we say. It might be easier for you to look out at a beautiful flower and say, that's beauty. Or a newborn baby, that's beauty. Or you look at a magnificent sunrise and say, that's beauty, that's beautiful. Well, in a similar way, when we say, what is the glory of God? The glory of God is almost impossible for us to fully define. But if we were to try to bring it together in a concept that's a little easier to understand, it would be the glory of God is the infinite beauty and greatness of God's many perfections. That includes the manifestations of his character and his worth and his attributes. It also includes his perfections and his greatness. Said differently, the glory of God is the infinite beauty that emanates from all of who he is. Now, take that idea, drop it back into the text. David says, be exalted above the heavens, O God. In other words, God, would you step out from among all others and would you be lifted high for all to see? 
Then he says, let your glory, let the infinite beauty and the greatness of who you are be clearly seen by the heavens and by the earth. It's in this moment that you begin to see a transition from David's focus being upon himself and his problems. And now he's focusing on God and his glory. Watch the way that transition impacts the remaining verses. Verse 6, they have prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They dug a pit before me. They themselves have fallen into the midst of it. Selah. I love this verse. Probably for the wrong reason, but I still love this verse. Basically, David is saying, they dug a pit for my demise, and yet they fell in it themselves. Selah. In other words, let me calmly think about what God just did. Or let me praise and lift him up for the fact my enemies just fell in their own pit. It's, it's one of those moments I'm like, David is a human like me. Because that's probably when I would have dropped a sila into this one as well. Like, you, you, know, you understand, like, praise God, sila, reflect upon that. But he's like, my enemies have fallen into their own pit. Let me think about that for a moment. I love it. Look at verse number seven. My heart is steadfast, O oh God. My heart is steadfast. He says it twice. I will sing. Yes, I will sing praises. At this point, he is locked in like a missile on what his target is. Twice, for emphasis purposes, he talks about my heart is fixed, oh God. My heart's fixed. My, my heart is not wavering. My heart is not wondering. My, my heart is not overwhelmed. My heart is fixed, oh God. And because my heart is now fixed, he says, I'll sing praises. Look at verse number eight. Awake, my glory. Awake, harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. Now, this first phrase, awake, my glory, that bothered me when I began to study it until I realized that the other way that this word is translated instead of my glory, it is my soul. David's talking to himself and not like in a bad, like he needs to be institutionalized sense. He's talking to himself in a good sense. Here's, have you ever had those moments when you've been in a pity party for so long, problem after problem keeps piling up, and you all of a sudden get to a place like, you got to get your junk together. you got to snap out of this. That's what he's saying. He says, awake, my soul. David, wake up. You've been in this too long. David, wake up. And then he looks over at his instruments of worship. It's a lyre and a harp there. It'd be like us looking over a guitar and saying, guitar, you've been down for too long. You need to wake up as well. And then for every morning person like me out there, it's a beautiful moment. He says, I will awaken the dawn. Ooh, okay. Listen, for those of you that are not morning people, the last thing you want to hear is a loud noise early in the morning. For those of us who are morning people, that's our prime time. So for what he's saying here, he's like, literally, he goes, my song of praise has been silenced for too long. I've been asleep. My soul has been asleep. My instruments of praise have been asleep. He says, I can't change what's in the past. That is done. But starting this morning, it's a new day. There's a new song and I'm going to sing. Let me wake up the dawn. I like it. David's got some praise in him here. Look at what it says in verse number nine. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will praise, I will sing praises to you among the nations. David is thanking God, listen, while still being in the cave. Sometimes we think, God, when you get me out of this, I'll praise you for it. No, you won't. You'll be just as self-centered coming out of the cave as you were before. Your praise starts in the cave. Your praise starts in a place where you're saying, God, I don't know what's going on, but there's something bigger at stake here than me and my feelings. That is you and your glory. And you begin to praise him in the context of whatever it is that you're going through. Look at what he says in verse number 10. For your loving kindness is great to the heavens and your truth to the clouds. Those, that's the two words again. That is loving kindness or mercy and truth. And as he's reflecting here, he's saying your mercy, that is your willingness to withhold what I deserve. 
It's overwhelming. He says it, it's, it's to the sky. And then he says, in your ability to speak truth into my life at just the right time takes me back. Verse number 11. Be exalted above the heavens, O God. Let your glory be above all the earth. It's the same words that he said back in verse number five. Twice in here, he's saying the exact same thing. God, be exalted. May you be pulled out from all others. May you be lifted up for all to see. God, you are glorious. That is your infinite beauty and your greatness that emanates from all of who you are. God, may you be glorified over all the earth. David's focus is no longer on him and his problems. His focus is now on God in his glory. By repeating the same thing twice, it's more than him just saying, God, my prayer is that you might be exalted more or that you might be glorified more. The fact he brings it up twice in this sense, it now raises three questions. How will he be exalted and glorified more? In what manner will he be exalted and glorified more? By whom will he be exalted and glorified more? And he gives us the answer in his praise. That is, oh God, be exalted and glorified in this situation. God, be exalted and glorified more in this moment. God, be exalted and glorified more in me. That's one of those things that happens whenever our focus comes off of ourselves and onto God. That is, in that moment, you can begin to say things like, God, I don't know how long I'm going to be here, but however long that is, would you receive the most glory for it? Ask yourself the question, if God is most glorified by your current problems, would you want to stay in it if you knew the problems would bring greater glory to him? If you say, no, I want to get out. You just saw the moment where self is what is now consuming you as opposed to your heart resting on something that is bigger, infinitely bigger than who we are. The more we make it about us, the harder and harder it is to walk through the difficult times. Here's your key truth again. Our focus and affections will always rest upon self until they are awakened and consumed by something bigger. David teaches us an incredibly valuable lesson here. And it's a lesson that's taught throughout the Bible, but it's also a lesson that is virtually non-existent in so much of our me-driven, self-driven church culture. So much of what happens in church life, and we're in church life, so much of it is, how will this benefit me? How will this help me? But because of that being a part of our culture, it's really difficult to move past me to focus more on him. Here's a, a truth that it's not in your notes. You might just want to write it down and ponder it and think about it. That is unfathomable joy awaits those who live for the glory of God. Unfathomable joy. In a world that encourages people to live for self, focus on self, gratify self, celebrate self, exalt self, is it any wonder that we battle some of the highest depression rates our world's ever seen? Some of the highest anxiety rates, some of the highest suicide rates, and the reason is not because the pain is not there. The reason is we've almost made it something of a badge of honor to keep focusing more and more on self. And let me just say, self is a low bar to focus on. But when you're at a place where you're saying, you know what? God, it's not about me. It's not about my pain. It hurts, God. I'm not going to take that away. It hurts. I'm discouraged. I'm overwhelmed. I feel as though sometimes you've dropped me on my head. It, it doesn't mean that we somehow bypass the pain of the moment. The issue is, can we move past the focus on self long enough to say, God, if you're letting this impact my life, it's because it has already been divinely and sovereignly and lovingly sifted through your hands for my good and for your glory. 
So how can I get away from focused on me to sit long enough to say, God, would you do your full work in my life? This next week, Easter Sunday, I'm excited. I'm so excited I can't hardly stand myself. And I say that a lot, but you all know I'm a pretty excited guy when it comes to what I get a chance to preach. I'm excited about what we get a chance to celebrate this next week. Here's what's going to happen the following week. We're going to come out of Easter Sunday, and I'm going to spend three weeks that we delve into the glory of God. And here's what we're going to focus on. We're going to focus on week number one with rightful glory. I want to show you through Scripture how everything in life, everything in history, everything in Scripture is pointing towards the glory of God. It is for the glory of God. And then we're going to come back on the next week and we're going to talk about stolen glory. What's happened along the way that is marring the glory of God? And one of the things that a lot of people don't like to hear is the fact every single one of us have stolen the glory of God at some point. In fact, it says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of what? The glory of God. What was it that caused Lucifer to fall from heaven? He wanted the glory that was rightfully going to God to now come back to him. And we're going to see what happens when they're stolen glory. And we're going to finish it up on the third week, and we're going to talk about reflected glory. And that is knowing that he is to be the primary focus. It's all about his glory. Knowing that sin will mar and keep the glory of God from being fully seen. How do we reflect the glory of God through the trials, through the good times, through every aspect of life? One of the things that I, I want to try my best to help create in that is if you look up in the night sky, you'll see that the, the moon many times is up there. And the moon is illuminated. And yet we know that there is no illuminating quality in the moon itself. It is bright because of the reflection of the sun on the moon. The same way with you and I. You and I cannot generate and create glory to bring to God. It's not as though God is glory deficient, like he's sitting at 60% right now. Somebody praise him fast. we got to boost up his glory levels. It, that's not it at all. But rather what it is, he is 100% full of glory at all times. The issue is we don't always see it because we're looking at other things. So how can it be in our lives that regardless of what we're going through, we are reflecting the glory of God back to him? That we are in a place where we're saying, God, doesn't matter what's happening. May you be glorified. Doesn't matter about the job loss. May you be glorified. Doesn't matter about the doctor's report. May you be glorified. Because it's in those moments of struggle, not in the high mountaintop experience. It's in the moments of struggle that we get a chance to know him. And it's in those moments of knowing him that we love him more. And it's in that time of loving him more that we pursue him with a greater and greater passion. I love what John Piper says. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. You know why he's not as glorified as he should be? Because sometimes all we're thinking about is us. So we're going to focus on the glory of God. Now, I'm going to find out whether or not I just scared everybody to death on that one, like intro for what the series is. I'm telling you, it's going to be a good time. God has a lot in store. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the privilege of knowing you, the privilege of serving you, the privilege of being able to worship you. God, help us in this area. Lord, we, we understand that one of the first instinctual things we do in difficult news is to process the information through the lens of self. God, would you bring us outside of that? Help us to see that bigger work, that higher objective that is at stake. God, we want to be people that in the midst of the dark moments, our praise is even louder. We want to be those types of people that when we go through difficult times and people are wondering, why do you still have a smile on your face? We can clearly say, because I know that this will end in the glory of God. God, help us to be those types of people. And God, it's not going to minimize the pain. But we understand that even 
in the dark caves of life. You are there. You are exalted. And your glory is overwhelming. God, minister deeply to the hearts of those that are here. In Jesus' name, amen.